OK, so this is going to work with uh, Andreas and Eric, who are both here in the audience. I'll talk about the POTS model and the Swenson Wang algorithm. So everybody saw these models, just uh, two quick slides. Easing model, label vertices by plus or minus, red or green, red, red or uh, blue. OK, weight of a configuration is b to the number of monochromatic edges, and we are interested in sampling from the distribution. Pots model, the same thing, except you have more than two colors. OK, so maybe three, maybe four, whatever. And again, you count the number of monochromatic edges. Weight of a configuration is b to the number of monochromatic edges. Now I will talk maybe a, a little bit about general spin models. So a general spin model, you have some number q, which is the number of spins. You have some interaction matrix B with no negative entries. Then you are looking at labelings of the vertices of the graph by the spins, one up to Q. And the weight of the configuration is just product over all edges. And you look at the entry in the matrix B, one endpoint, the other endpoint, and that's the weight of the configuration. Okay. So, so for the easing model, you will have two by two matrix like this. For POTS model, you will have a 3 by 3 or 4 by 4 or 5 by 5 matrix like that. OK, so we can look at many spin models, and there are lots of interesting questions you can ask. So the first question I guess you would ask is, is it easy to sample from the model on general graphs? Okay. Now, sometimes this is possible. For example, for a ferromagnetic easing model, this is possible. But more often, it's not possible. Okay, so for most models, we are unable to sample from the distribution of the model on general graphs. So I guess we have to look at more constraints on the graph. Okay. Now, one such constraint that seems to be good is looking at the maximum degree. Okay, so for maximum degree five graphs, sampling is easy. For maximum degree six graphs, it's difficult for the independent sets model. Okay. But uh, you can, I mean, that, this is a more of a complexity question. Complexity questions are usually pretty difficult. Sometimes you can get some insight from easier questions about the dynamics, like how do dynamics behave on graphs. So for example, for independent sets, we know that for maximum degree four graphs, the uh, Glauber dynamics which is a chain that only flips one vertex at a time, is rapidly mixing. On the other hand, for random six regular graphs, it's slow. Now maybe if uh, analyzing the Glauber dynamics on maximum degree delta graphs is too difficult, it might be easier to look at random graphs. If you want to understand dynamics on random graphs, well, then it would be helpful to understand how the typical configurations of the model look on, on the random graphs. And Glauber dynamics is not the only chain that you can use, so we are going to explore what are the Markov chains you can use. Okay. Now, so these are the motivating questions for why I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Okay. Uh, but I want to have a, a yet simpler question. Okay, so we are going to look at these mean field models. So what does mean field model mean? That means that I'm going to look at the model on the complete graph. Okay. Now, that makes things nice and symmetric, very easy. We are going to have to reparameterize the model to get interesting behavior. Okay, so when you when you study a spin model on general graphs, usually you fix the interaction matrix and you study it for for all graphs or maybe all graphs of some maximum degree. Well, here, if this n goes to infinity, you have to make the interaction weaker and weaker as you get more and more vertices. And I guess uh, for Pot's model and easing model, there is a accepted way of doing it. OK, so the interaction for the monochromatic edges, you take 1 plus some constant over n. That constant I'll call b. OK, later on. Now it's just different c. I guess uh, it's an interesting, I, I don't know how to 
define mean field model for a general spin model. I am not sure what the, what the right thing is, maybe taking like one over n of each entry in the matrix as n goes to infinity. So I guess it's a good question whether we can get some insight from, from this mean field for other models. Okay, so let's, uh, uh, let's go to the spot slash easing model. Okay. So I'm looking at the model on the complete graph with n vertices. I'm going to look at how a configuration can look like. Well, the configuration has uh, some bunch of vertices with spin one, bunch of vertices with spin two, bunch of vertices with spin q. The number of monochromatic edges is easy to figure out from this, right? There is no structure in the graph. And the weight of a configuration is something like this. For convenience, I replaced one plus B over N to, uh, by one minus B N to negative of that quantity. It's the same thing. Okay, so, the, so this is the model we are going to be looking at. Okay. And we are not the first people to look at the model. Okay, so people looked at the questions that were on the slide with questions for the mean field model. So you can ask, is Glauber dynamics fast for the POTS model, for the easing model? And of course this should be, I mean this is just a motivating question. Okay, so the, the answers here are, uh, what is the mixing time of the Glauber dynamics on the mean field model? Okay, so for Easing model, we know that the Glauber dynamics is fast, 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 up to some critical point. At that critical point, it has polynomial mixing time, and beyond the critical point, the mixing time is exponential. Okay. And for POTS model, similar behavior, really fast, and log n mixing time, hit the threshold, polynomial mixing time, and beyond the threshold, it's exponential. Now the chain we are going to analyze is, is a little bit different. So this is the Swenson Wang chain, which I guess is arose because of connection between the POTS model and the random cluster model, but, but we are not going to need uh, to understand the connection. Okay, so here is how the chain works. So we, we have some coloring of the vertices. Okay, this is an example. Then what we do is we look at the set of monochromatic edges. Then we are going to remove each edge from this set with certain probability, one over B. And then we are going to get some connected components and we are going to assign a uniformly random color to each of the components. So this is one step of the chain. Now the nice thing here is that the set of monochromatic edges that we get from, a, from one component is a complete graph. And then we are performing a, a percolation on this uh, random complete, uh, on, on this complete graph, which is well studied problem. This is the erdos reni random graph model. So people looked at this question too for the easing model, okay. so they showed that the easing model <coughs> is really, really, f uh, uh, for the easing model, the Swenson Wang dynamics is really, really fast up to some threshold. At the threshold, it slows down to some polynomial mixing time, and beyond the threshold, well, it gets really fast again, but not as fast as it was for small. I guess for comparison, if you compare it with the Glauber dynamics, okay, the mixing time beyond the threshold for the Glauber dynamics was exponential, whereas here we are going to have really fast mixing time. That, that's the appeal of the Swenson Wang dynamics. It's fast for polynomial time everywhere. Uh, I guess this is, this is, these are the results that we get, is that for POTS model there are actually several critical points. It's not just one critical point. So there is some critical point 
up to which the chain is fast. At that critical point, it slows down to polynomial, and then it's exponential for a while, and there is another threshold after which the chain is going to be fast again. Okay. So in order to give you a little bit of insight on how these things are proved, I have to understand the typical configurations of, uh, of the model. Okay, so uh, type of a configuration is fraction of the vertices that have spin one, fraction of the vertices that have spin two, fraction of the vertices that have spin q. You can argue that actually the only interesting configurations are ones where one color has more weight than the other colors, and the other colors are about equal. Okay? So then what you can do is you can look at the total weight of configurations with this type. You can plot a curve, and you are going to look at this curve and try to infer what is going on with the model. Okay? So if you are below this first threshold, you are going to look, and there is going to be just one peak. Okay? So, so the dominant configurations are the ones where a is 1 over Q, all of these things are 1 over Q, the configurations are totally uniform. There is, there is no correlations between the spins at different sites. Okay? Then you go a little bit further and suddenly you will see that there is a little peak that is starting to grow here. So that's a little volcano that's starting to grow there. Okay? And you go slightly be, be, be beyond, and the volcano is sticking out, and now you have two points. Okay? And I guess this explains why the global dynamics starts to be slow, because, well, if you are here, that means one do color dominates, and there is no way is of escaping this peak by just small moves. Okay? Go further, 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 and at the second critical point, what happens is that, this, that uh, the uh, little maximum that you had for the, for the uniform uh, configurations disappears, and you only are left with configurations which have one color dominating. Now, this is, this is still a problem for the Glauber dynamics, but it's not an issue for the Swens and Wang, because Swens and Wang picks a component and recolor it, recolors it by a color which is uniformly at random, okay? So you can move between the peaks corresponding to different colors. Okay, so that, uh, I guess looking at these pictures, you can understand why the Glauber dynamics behaves the way it behaves. If you want to understand how Swens and Wang behaves, you have to, I guess, look more into the dynamics and uh, the thing that controls the behavior of the dynamics is the behavior of the giant component in the in the Erdos Reni uh, model. Okay, so here here is the here is the useful thing. Okay, so we understand that if we have a Erdos Reni uh, random graph, then if we have a probability of picking an edge t over n where c is bigger than 1, then this is a giant component, and we pretty much understand the size of this component. Okay. And you take this and you translate it into the Swens and Wang dynamics, and you are going to see that the evolution of the largest color class, okay, so you are going to say, well, let's just hope that there is one big color class and the remaining ones are small and that's going to happen, the evolution of the largest color class is governed by some function f like this, okay? Which is connected to the random graph model. Okay, so there is some function f that explains how the dynamics behaves if, uh, if you assume that you have just one large color class, okay? So now you can, now you can look at the, this function f and you can look at the function below the first threshold, at the first threshold, between the thresholds, everything, okay? And you are going to look at these pictures and you are going to see that if you are below the first threshold, then there is one, just one fixed point. 
okay, of this function. If you are at the first threshold, there are two fixed points. Okay, if you are between the thresholds, there are two fixed points, two fixed points, and suddenly here just one fixed point. Okay, so this is going to explain why it's fast here, maybe fast here. There are just two. The, in each case, there is just one fixed point, and the dynamics is going to get to there. In this case, there are two fixed points, and they are going to fight. Okay, and what happens uh, exactly at the at the thresholds? Well, that's a little bit finer analysis. Okay, so let me not go too deep into details how <coughs> how these proofs go, but just a just a high level overview. Okay, so let's say if you are below the first threshold, below the we call that uniqueness threshold, what is going to happen is that the mixing time is going to be theta of one. Okay, so you are at some point. What the value here tells you is by how much does the size of the largest component decreases. Okay, so it always decreases by a pretty big amount. Decreases, decreases, decreases. The decrease speeds up. You hit here, and everything shatters, and you are in the uniform distribution. And in all of one steps, you are going to mix. Okay, so the explanation why the mixing time here is O of one is you are always decreasing, and this decrease is pretty fast, faster, faster, hit here, and you are in a uniform distribution. On the other hand, if you are above the second threshold, okay, so again, we are going to have a drift toward this fixed point, but, the, but there is no, no abrupt place that will that will get us to that fixed point quickly. So what is going to be happening is that we are getting closer and closer and closer to the fixed point, but we are getting there slower, 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 slower. So we are going to actually need about log n steps to, to get <clears throat> within something like plus minus square root of n, and then plus minus square root of n, you are going to couple because of the fluctuations, and then you are going to do a little bit more coupling. Okay, so this, uh, these two slides explain why the why the chain is fix, uh, uh, why the chain is fast <coughs> below the first fixed point, above uh, the second fixed point uh, uh, or the second critical point, and why there is a slight difference between the running times. Now, understanding the dynamics between the fixed points that's actually pretty easy. Okay, here you just need to show that the mixing time is low and uh, well I'm cheating here uh, we cannot quite prove this okay it would be nice if we could prove this but what we have is n to the theta of one okay but aside from that the proof is well if you are in a configuration around this point you are going to stay there. If you are in a configuration around this point, you are going to stay there. Now, the, the, the most interesting two cases are at the critical points. And uh, if you are at the critical point, the second critical point, the question is why why does the dynamics escape from the from the uniform distribution? And if you if you look at the derivative of this function f at the at the uniform critical point, then this this number here is bigger than one when q is bigger than two. It's ex equal to one when q is equal to two. So that explains why there is a difference between uh, e easing and the POTS model, I guess. The derivative is bigger than one, so even though this is a fixed point in the, sec in the first order, in the, in the derivative, there is a little bit of drift. So you are going to be here, maybe by some stochastic effects, you are going to get a little bit of variation, but then you are just going to get booted from the vicinity of that point. And that's going to happen in log n steps because the distance is geometrically increasing. 
So the most interesting point is uh, the uniform, this, uh, 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 the uniqueness uh, critical point. Here the mixing time is polynomial. <coughs> what is going to eventually happen is the chain is going to converge to the uniform distribution. And the difficult part is arguing uh, uh, that the chain will escape from around the majority fixed point. Now, if you are at this point, there is no drift. There is almost no drift. Uh, so in expectation, if you look, uh, the size of the largest color class is not going to decrease in expectation. Okay. So what we are going to have to do is we have to we are going to have to rely on variance to to get us out from this point. Okay. So so expectation does nothing to us, but there is a lot of variance, right? Because we are picking a random subgraph in this Erdos-Reni model, so that gives us I don't know square root of uh, n variance, maybe n to the one third variance. So we are getting a lot of variance. The variance aggregates is going to kick us out far enough. And then the drift is going to take over and take us to the uniform distribution. Okay. Now, that's uh, the intuition. We, we tried for a few weeks or maybe a month to make a proof which, is, uh, which would follow this intuition, but we couldn't. So uh, the only thing you can do at that point is resort to a potential function argument. You figure out the potential function which encodes your intuition. and you just suffer and prove a bunch of inequalities, but uh, it, the potential function captures this intuition. Okay, so you find the potential function. The potential function, what it's going to do is it's going to have a big second de derivative uh, in in this bad window. Okay, and the second derivative is going to make sure that the potential function decreases in expectation because of the variance <coughs> in that window. And then you engineer the function that outside the window, well, the, the function value also decreases in expectation now because of the drift. Okay. So I think this is, this is uh, enough about the, about the, the proof. So let me let me say a few things about the random graphs. Okay. So all all this, uh, I guess, uh, the hope for the, the hope here is that we are going to get some insight about the random graphs from from doing this, and and we are going to get some insight. Okay. So so the 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 the, the, the question that we would like to understand is how does a uh, spin model behave on a random delta regular graph. Does the Glauber dynamics mix on a random delta regular graph? Does Swenson Wang mix on a delta regular graph? Now, before looking into this question, what we have to do is we have to understand the typical configurations of the model on the random delta regular graph. So the mental thing that you want to do is you want to sample a random delta regular graph. You want to sample a random configuration from the model and try to understand how it looks. Now, this is usually done in a, in a reverse way, where you look at configurations of certain type. Then you are going to look at the expected value of the weight of configurations of this type over the choice of the random graph. You are going to look at the second moment of this quantity. You are going to do a little bit more work. And then you are going to get some statement that with high probability, the actual weight of configurations of this type in the random graph is bigger or equal than the expected value. Now, if you look at the Volts model on a random delta regular graph, you are going to perform this process you are going to look at the first moment, and you are going to see the same pictures as you saw for the mean field model. Okay, so the mean field model is uh, providing you some picture for the random delta regular graph. Okay, so there are going to be again two thresholds. 
and you are going to see the same pictures. Okay. So again, the only interesting kinds of configurations are where one color is dominating and the rest of the colors are about equal. Now, you would like to infer from these pictures that Glauber dynamics is slow. You would like to infer that the Swenson Wang dynamics is slow. Now, unfortunately, we are unable to do that. Okay, so you would conjecture that the same things should happen on the random delta regular graph as, as happen on, on the mean field model. Okay, so you would like to hope that Glauber dynamics starting from this point, it should be slow, okay? Swainson Wang should be slow in the entire interval. Okay. Now, there are some things that are known. Okay, so we know that the Glauber dynamics is slow, but we cannot quite go up to the uniqueness point. Okay. We know that the Swainson Wang is slow exactly at this point where the uniform and the one color dominating are about balanced. Okay. We also know something about some hardness of computing the partition function for graphs of maximum degree delta from this point. And what is the what is the main difficulty? Okay, so why do why why are we why are we unable to do the same thing for the random delta regular graphs as we can do for for the complete graph? Well, we have trouble with the second moment. We are unable we are unable to prove the second moment. Okay. Yes. What's the point about this? What's the point? What's, the, what's this point? Yeah. Did you say already? I, 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 so I mean, we know f from this point on that uh, approximating the partition function on the on the, on delta regular graphs or graphs of maximum degree delta. Is sharp is hard. As hard as this. As hard as this. And uh, this relies on the hardness of the POTS model on general graphs. So this is, this is just using a, a random, what you do is you take, you take that reduction, which is a little bit more sophisticated than this one, and you just replace every vertex by a, by a random delta regular graph just to control the degree. Okay, maybe you remove some vertex of degree to make them degree delta minus one so that you have stuff for connections. Okay, so I'm going to say a little bit about the second moment. Why do we have difficulty and when can we do it? Okay. okay so, so uh, we, we can we can establish the second moment sometimes. Okay. Now, how do we how do we establish the how do we establish the second moment? Well, we can establish the second moment for configurations which are global maxima of the first moment. Okay. So that's what we can do. We can establish the second moment matching the square of the first moment if and only if the configurations are local maximum of the first moment. How this is done? Well, we, we have the first moment, that's some bunch of formulas. You are going to sit down and write them up. And there is a connection between the first moment, some thing we call scale expression, which is some kind of matrix norm for the interaction matrix, and the three recursions of the model. Okay, and Andreas is going to give a talk about this where he will explain these things more in the detail. And why, why, why this connection allows us to do second moment at the maxima is, well, because uh, the second moment is like the first moment except for the spin system where the interaction matrix is the tensor product of the interaction matrix with itself. Okay, and then if you, and there are some marginality constraints, if you drop them, you are going to look here, and these matrix norms, they tensorize, and you are going to get your second moment, okay? That's, that's how we can get second moment if we are at a local maximum of the first moment. 
the reason why we can only do local maxima is that we only can understand the the, the global maxima of these expressions. We we have no way of we have no way of putting uh, the marginality constraints in. Everybody okay with this? Uh, just high level. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to show you an example where actually the second moment calculation can be done at at all at all uh, uh, maxima, even the local ones. Okay. So, so I'm going to have to look at these Holland problems, which are pretty popular in the exact counting, but not so much in the approximate counting. And I guess the reason is because we don't have any interesting negative results. Uh, I don't know why. So maybe they'll be popular soon. Okay. So what is Holland problem? I'm going to look at Holland problems, which are homogeneous. Okay. So we, what we have is we, we have a parameter delta, which is the degree. I have a bunch of numbers, f0 up to f, f delta. Then I'm going to be looking at delta regular graphs. And then I have a distribution on subsets of the edges, where the probability of a subset is f0 to the number of vertices which have degree 0, f1 to the number of vertices of degree 1, f delta to the number of vertices of degree delta. Okay. So here is an example of a Holland problem. Okay, so let's say delta is equal to 3, f0, f3 is 1, f1, f2 is 1 fifth. And this is going to be my graph. Then I have, I don't know how many edges. Eight edges, so there are 256 different configurations. And let's say this configuration, all the vertices are of degree 0, so the configuration should have weight proportional to 1. This has two vertices of degree 0, four vertices of degree 2. The weight should be proportional to 1 over 625. Okay? So this is much like this, a spin system, except now the edges are the ones which are assigned spin 0 and 1, and you are measuring the weights on the, on the vertices. Okay? So, so the, uh, Example of a Holland problem, well, matchings, monomer dimer problem would fit in this framework. Okay, if I have F01, F11, everything else zero, then I'm only allowing vertices of degree zero and one. So the valid configurations are going to be matchings. I can encode perfect matchings if I require all, all vertices to be of degree one. And now I would like to understand how does a Holland problem behave on a random delta regular graph. Okay? So I'm going to play the same game as I do for the spin system. I look at a signature of a configuration, which is the fraction of the vertices that have degree 0 up to fraction of the vertices which have degree delta. I'm going to look at weight of these configurations in expectation over the choice of the random graph. And I would like to know if the second moment works or if I can. Okay. I would like to know whether the second moment works. Okay. So you, you uh, no, 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 no expectation of you reading the formula. It's always a little bit of pain. I just want to get the, the, the big picture. Okay, so you, 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 the first moment, you are going to sit down and write an expression. And then you are going to study the asymptotic growth of that ex ex expression as a function of n. Okay? And you are, going to, you are going to get some understanding okay, of what that is. Okay? Now, the second moment, the same thing. You are going to write a bunch of formulas, and you are going to figure out what the second moment is, at least the asymptotic growth rate. Okay? And the interesting thing here is that for these problems, actually the second moment is always bounded by the square of the first moment. Okay. So here I have an example of, a, of this first moment, second moment problem where the second moment always works. I am not going to go into the proof deeply, but just uh, 
idea how that proof works. Okay, so what you can do is you look at the expression for the first moment, you look at the expression for the second moment, and you can express the second moment as some kind of entropy of some random variable on binary strings. And here you are looking at the first bit of the string, and you look at the expression, and if you interpret these gammas, whatever they are, as probabilities, you are going to see that this is some difference of two entropies. Okay? Now you are going to look at what the expression for the first moment is, and you are going to get that it's the same thing, except you are now looking at entropies, not of this joint distribution, but individual variables. Okay? And then if you want to show that the second moment is at most square of the first moment in logarithm, the logarithm of the first moment less than or equal than twice the logarithm, the, the logarithm of the second moment less than or equal than twice the logarithm of the first moment, you are going to get some inequality about mutual information, and you use some properties of the mutual information, and you are going to get it in full generality. Okay, so, so sometimes, sometimes the second moment can work, but why doesn't it work for the delta regular graphs and the and the Swens and the and the pot model, I have no clue. Okay. So, so I told you about these uh, three ways of looking at the at the model. Okay. You can look at the model through the first moment. You can look at the model through some kind of scale-free expression. You can look at the model through three recursions. Each view gives you different different power. Okay. So here. It's interesting that you can do the same thing for the for the Holland problems. Okay, you can look at the first moment. You saw these things. You can you can do three recursions as well. The three recursions will have just two variables, or one variable is enough, right? Because you are only having in a subtree. You are looking at the weight of the subtree if the edge is present or the edge is not present. Okay, so the three recursions are going to be with two variables. If you want to keep things. In the projective space, if you want to take the ratio, you can do that, though it's nicer this way. And you can also get some kind of scale-free expression, much like we get for spin systems. Okay? Now, since the, first mo uh, since the second moment for these Holland problems works always, it works not just at the global maxima, but also at the local maxima. Okay? If you want to understand how a uh, Holland problem behaves on a random delta regular graph, is that you are going to take your f's, you are going to take this function here, you are just going to plot it. Okay. And if you see that this function in the plot has two a maxima, then you are going to know that the Glauber dynamics is, let's say, slow. If by Glauber dynamics, you mean the dynamics that flips an edge each time. Okay. So I would like to have something like this for spin models as well understanding the typical configurations through the scale-free expression and get the automatic second moment. So that's the end, I guess. So these are just the questions. Uh, so why can't we get hardness or slowness of Glauber dynamics in this interval? Or why can't we get hardness of the Pots model on maximum degree delta graphs in this interval. We can maybe go here, but we are not all the way to the unique threshold. Why, why, why do we have trouble with the second moment for these spin systems? What is, what is going on? Okay. Now, understanding the configurations on the random delta regular graph, well, that's enough for negative results. Now, the positive results, that's, that's a way harder thing. And just understanding the Typical configurations is not going to be helpful. So this, this is a much harder question. But uh, okay. what is it with Swenson Wang for POTS model? Is it fast on max degree delta graphs? Is it fast on random delta regular graphs? And uh, I would like to also know, so this is the second time I see this connection between three recursions, first moment, and some kind of nice expression. Is there something d deeper going on? Is this some kind of general principle? Is there a painless way of giving these connections? I, th I think there must be something. This is generally speaking. 
it, it should be general, right? For every. Right. But is there like any spin system slash Holland? Will you, without any pain, get the, let's say, there's some kind of expression that you just can plot and understand how the model behaves on the random delta regular graph? Like, much like uh, like the, whatever is there for the for the spin models that you are looking at the interaction matrix and you are looking at these induced matrix norms and somehow the maximizers of the matrix norms tell you the behavior of the model on random delta regular graphs. Okay, so I'm done. <laughs> Any questions? I have a simple question. I mean, just to check, finally check if I understood what you said, sort of, right? So, uh, if uh, you switch signs a few times, but if, if it's one minus b over n to a number of uh, Negative number of monochromatic edges. Then, uh, for the um, mean field model, you want the number of edges of each color to be the same, or to be the highest. Uh, no, you want to have as many monochromatic edges as possible, right? Because it's uh, effective. I mean, okay. So minus minus is like plus. So it's like something bigger than one to the number of monochromatic edges. But in any case, it only matters how many edges of each monochromatic color there is in, in the mean field model. Uh, correct, but but uh, that's right, and you don't distinguish. That's now, Swenson Lang has difficulty reducing the size of the largest color class in some sense because you switch all all components. Yeah. Right. All right. Glover then switches it very slowly, but it does end up changing the number of vertices of each color a little better than Swenson Lang does. Right. Is that the problem? In, you know, you you have to resort to variance to prove that. Swenson Lang actually goes to. Do you mean you mean at the uniqueness? Number of vertices of each color. At the uh, I think the two things are one of the colors. But if it's too big, don't worry about mm -hmm. it. So. Uh, how big are the color glasses where Swenson Lang works? I mean, you can always separate one vertex. It's going to happen, right? And then you are just going to recolor the vertex. So the Swenson Lang should be faster than the Glauber dynamics. So all they should be. Uh, yeah, maybe. But the largest color glass in Swenson Lang will only tend to increase, right? I mean, it depends where you are, right? So, so, so if you if you are if you are, let's say, beyond the uniqueness and you are close to this majority fixed point, you are going to stick around there, but uh, Glauber dynamics is going to do the same. But, but I, I guess the interesting thing is that if you go beyond here, then the only interesting configurations are where there is a big color class, and then the Swenson Wang is moving between them quickly. the problem, you did this uh, second moment calculation. Uh, does it apply to all constraint functions, or uh, do you allow zero ways? Uh, say we have perfect matchings. Uh, does it uh, hmm. I, I think yes, but I would have to check. I mean, I worked on the assumption that all the entries in F are positive, but uh, I would think it, it, it should work. Well, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, that's right. So I, 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 I don't have a, I don't have a nice Holland problem where, let's say, I would conjecture that it's computationally hard. I mean, you can cook up examples where you look at the Holland problem and you look at this expression and it's going to have two maxima. Let's say, uh, if you look at symmetric Holland problems with delta equal three, one, if you go beyond one-fifth, 
below one fifth, you are going to have two maxima. So the Glauber dynamics is going to be slow. If you go above one fifth, you have just one peak. Is the Glauber dynamics fast? I have no clue. Conditioning. That's uh, that's right. So I mean, to get a statement of this, uh, you ha you have to do some extra work beyond matching the second moment to the square of the first moment, right? So there is some extra work involved to get a high probability statement. Okay. Well, thank you very much.